Good afternoon everyone. Thank you for joining us for the latest in the Beale & Company series of legal update webinars. This afternoon we will be discussing the new Insurance Act 2015 and what it means for you as an insured. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Nathan Modell and I'm a partner at Beale & Company. Today I'm pleased to be joined by my colleague Ian Massa who is also a partner at Beale & Company and our special guest Craig Roberts who is a, an associate director at Griffiths & Armour Insurance Brokers. Ian and I will be discussing the key changes brought about by the Insurance Act, while Craig will provide some general commentary on the new Act and some practical advice for you as an insured. Before I begin, a quick reminder about some housekeeping. During the webinar, you may submit questions to us in the box which should appear on the right-hand side of your screen. We will try to answer these as we go along, or we will contact you after the webinar. If possible, please make sure your microphones are on mute. To provide some background to the new Act, at present, insurance law in the United Kingdom is based upon principles developed in the 18th and 19th centuries. These principles were codified in the Machine Marine Insurance Act 1906. The 1906 Act applied to both marine and non-marine insurance and is predominantly insurer-focused as it was designed to protect the insurance industry against exploitation. Just over 100 years later, the current law does not accurately reflect businesses of the modern world and the ways in which people communicate, store and analyse information. The law is therefore seen as outdated. As a result, the Law Commission decided it was necessary to update the existing law by removing outdated and onerous rules and replacing them with ones which are broadly neutral between insured and insurers to help redress the perceived imbalance. Consumer Insurance Law has already been updated by the Consumer Insurance Disclosure and Representations Act 2012, which came into force on the 6th of April 2013. The Insurance Act 2015 applies in respect of commercial insurance contracts. Following a long consultation period to allow the industry to consider and plan, the Insurance Act finally comes into force on the 12th of August 2016. The new Act applies to insurance and reinsurance contracts governed by the laws of England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, wherever those contracts are underwritten. Therefore, the new Act will apply to all insurance policies which are subject to English law. The new Act specifically applies to insurance contracts entered into on or after the 12th of August 2016, or variations made on or after the 12th of August 2016 in respect of insurance contracts which may have been entered into before this date. The main changes which we will be talking about today are as follows. The duty of disclosure, both before a contract incepts and when amended, warranties, fraudulent claims, contracting out, and the, rights, the third party Rights Against Insurers Act 2010. I will now hand over to my colleague, Ian Massa, who will be taking, talking about the first of these, the duty of disclosure, which may have the greatest impact on insureds. As Nathan has just indicated, one of the key features addressed by the new Insurance Act is the duty of disclosure. I want to spend a few minutes quickly summarising the current law, which will help to contextualise the new changes that are shortly going to be coming into force in August. Historically, the duty of disclosure in insurance law placed a heavy burden on insureds. As a result of sections 17 to 20 of the Marine Insurance Act 1906, we are all more than familiar with the phrases utmost good faith, material circumstances and avoidance of the policy for non-disclosure. In summary, an insurance contract was deemed to be a contract of utmost good faith. Prior to the creation of the insurance contract, an insurer was required to disclose all information that was material to an insurer's assessment of risk, even if the insurer did not ask a specific question regarding that issue on the proposal form. Furthermore, the insured was deemed to know every circumstance which, in the ordinary course of business, ought to be known to him. If the insurer failed to disclose every material circumstance to insurers, 
i.e. any piece of information which would influence the judgment of a prudent insurer in fixing the insurance premium or deciding whether to accept the risk in the first place, then the insurers could avoid the policy altogether, i.e. not just decline cover in respect of any claim subsequently notified. The remedy of policy avoidance for non-disclosure of a material circumstance and or misrepresentation was the main complaint by insureds of what was perceived as the unfairness of the position under the current law. The following example demonstrates how draconian the remedy of policy avoidance is, albeit in the context of a misrepresentation to insurers as opposed to non-disclosure of a material circumstance. So the example is as follows. An insured takes out an insurance policy to protect a warehouse they own against damage to the property itself. On the proposal form, the insured is asked whether or not they have burglar alarms at the warehouse. They answer yes to this question. In fact, at the time of completing the proposal form, the insured hadn't yet installed burglar alarms at the warehouse. The intention was always to install them, but they end up forgetting to do so. A few weeks later, an electrical fault causes a fire and part of the warehouse suffers fire damage. The insured makes a claim under their policy seeking an indemnity in respect to the costs of repairing the warehouse. The insurer's loss adjuster visits the warehouse and notes that no burglar alarms have been fitted. He reports this to the insurer, who notes that the insurer's proposal form stated that burglar alarms had been installed at the warehouse. Even though the damage to the warehouse was not in any way caused by the insured's failure to install burglar alarms, the insurers could, in theory, if they could demonstrate that the misrepresentation induced them into entering into the insurance contract in the first place, avoid the policy altogether. To reduce the risk of insurers seeking to avoid policies on such grounds, prospective insureds were not taking any chances and were sometimes either disclosing vast quantities of supporting documentation with proposal forms or were concealing key elements of risk amidst a raft of documents that were disclosed to insurers. This concept became known as data dumping. As a result of all of these issues, it became clear that a change to the existing legislation was required. It may surprise some of you to know that reform to English insurance law was first tabled as far back as 1957 by the then Law Reform Committee. It was then picked up again in 1980 by the Law Commission, but it was not until 2006 that the serious work began into reforming the law in this area. The end product was the Law Commission's report of 2014, which paved the way for the Insurance Act 2015. The principal aim of the Insurance Act 2015 is to address the balance between insurers and business insureds when it comes to the disclosure of information relevant to an insurer's assessment of risk. As such, the Insurance Act replaces the old duty of disclosure with a new obligation to make a fair presentation of risk. The obligation to make a fair presentation of risk seeks to promote the disclosure of information relevant to an insurer's assessment of risk as a cooperative exercise between insurers and insureds. The rationale behind this approach is simple. The insured will know the specific information relevant to how their business is run and the insurer will know which of that information is relevant to their assessment of risk. So what does an obligation to make a fair presentation of risk actually entail from an insured's perspective? There are two alternative limbs that an insured must satisfy in order to discharge their obligation to make a fair presentation of risk under the new Insurance Act. Firstly, an insured is required to disclose every material circumstance which the insured knows or ought to know about, and they can't make any misrepresentations to insurers. This is effectively identical to what will be the old statutory provisions contained in the Marine Insurance Act. However, under the new provisions, if an insured somehow failed to satisfy the first limb, then they will be deemed to have discharged their obligation to make a fair presentation of risk if they have still disclosed sufficient information to put a prudent insurer on notice that they need to make further inquiries of the insured. This change to the existing law reinforces the need for insurer involvement at the underwriting stage to balance the insured's task of trying to detail every bit of information that an insurer may consider is relevant to their assessment of risk. 
Another significant change brought about by the Insurance Act is the fact that the obligation to make a fair presentation of risk defines not just the content that must be disclosed, but also the form that the disclosure must take. Therefore, a fair presentation of risk also requires an insured to make the various disclosures of information in a manner that is reasonably clear and accessible to a prudent insurer. In other words, if a presentation is substantial, then it must be adequately signposted and or indexed to enable a prospective insurer to appreciate the significant details of the risk. It is hoped that these provisions will discourage the historic conduct of data dumping. Finally, insureds cannot completely forget about acting with utmost good faith under the new legislation. This is an important point that seems to have been overlooked by a lot of the seminars I have attended and the articles that I have read on the subject. Whilst the Insurance Act 2015 does not attempt to recast or replicate the principle of utmost good faith, and Section 14 of the Insurance Act abolishes the remedy of avoidance for breach of utmost good faith, the Law Commission have suggested in their 2014 report that the Insurance Act retains the duty of good faith as an interpretive principle. Furthermore, the phrase good faith does appear in the Insurance Act at Section 3.3c, albeit in the context that every material representation as to a matter of expectation or belief, i.e. distinct from a representation of a matter of fact, must be made by an insured in good faith. Other commentators are of the opinion that the principle of good faith will affect the duty of fair presentation in that the principle of good faith will influence the way in which courts determine the adequacy of a fair presentation of risk. For example, where there are unusual or significant elements about the risk that are contained within an overall presentation, a court may find that, it, that an insured has breached the duty of good faith by not seeking to draw to the insurer's attention those elements despite the presentation being clearly set out and adequately indexed. The level of knowledge required of the insured to give a fair presentation of risk in respect to the first limb, i.e. every material circumstance which the insured knows about or ought to know about, is clarified by Section 4 of the Insurance Act. In terms of actual knowledge under the new provisions, the knowledge of a number of people may be relevant to the scope of disclosure required in order for an insured to discharge their obligation to make a fair presentation of risk. Where the insured is an individual, they will be attributed with the actual knowledge of any broker or individual who arranged their insurance. For non-individuals, i.e. partnerships, LLPs or companies, the insured will be attributed with the actual knowledge of firstly its senior management, i.e. using the words from the Insurance Act itself, this means individuals who play significant roles in the making of decisions about how the insured's activities are to be managed or organised and secondly, persons responsible for arranging its insurance. Again, using the wording from the Insurance Act, this means someone who participates on behalf of the insured in the procurement of insurance. In terms of what an insured ought to know about, the Insurance Act doesn't make a distinction between whether the insured is an individual or a non-individual. What an insured ought to know about is defined by the constructive knowledge which would have been revealed through the requirement to conduct a reasonable search. I will go into more detail on this shortly. The Insurance Act also preserves the common law principle that an insured will be deemed to have actual or constructive knowledge of information that he has turned a blind eye to and deliberately refrained from finding out. In terms of insurer knowledge, it is not necessary for an insured to, to disclose matters of which the insurer is already aware or is deemed to be aware of. The Insurance Act creates a positive duty of inquiry for the insurer. There are two types of information which insurers ought to know. The first is information which the insurer knows or ought reasonably to have passed to the underwriter. This includes information held by the Claims Department or expert reports commissioned for the purposes of assessing risk. 
The second category is intended to require the relevant underwriter to make a reasonable effort to search such information as is available to them within the insurer's organisation, such as the insurer's electronic records. Out of all of the information and records which might be available to a prospective insured, it is only information that is both material, i.e. anything that would influence the judgment of a prudent insurer in determining whether to take the risk, and if so on what terms, and information that is within the insured's actual or constructive knowledge that has to be disclosed to insurers. The previous slide touched on all of the key issues regarding the insured's knowledge, but by far the most radical reform to the insured's duty of fair presentation under the Insurance Act concerns the insured's constructive knowledge which would have been revealed through the requirement to conduct a reasonable search. There are th three key questions to consider which determine the scope of the insured's requirement to conduct a reasonable search. The first question is what constitutes a reasonable search. The answer to this will depend on the size, nature and complexity of the insured's business. The second question is what reasonably should have been revealed? The anticipated answer to this question is all information revealed by a search conducted by a reasonable prudent insured. However, it is not yet clear if the answer to this, to this question is intended to be entirely subjective or whether it also contains an objective element. The final question is what is available to the insured. Now this is largely a question of fact but insureds should exercise caution here as the 2014 Law Commission report intended this, the answer to this question to include information within reason that is known to employees. The reason this is an important issue is because if the courts adopt this approach, then we could well find the courts interpreting this section of the Insurance Act such that the insured's knowledge could be deemed to include both the knowledge of senior management, i.e. actual knowledge, and knowledge of employees, i.e. constructive knowledge, which would have been revealed through the requirement to conduct a reasonable search. As you can see from this slide, Insurer's knowledge is broken down into three categories. Firstly, what the insurer knows. Now an example of this would be what is disclosed on the proposal form itself. The second example is what the insurer ought to know. Now for example, this may include information passed on to an underwriter by an insurer's appointed loss adjuster or information contained, say, on previous proposal forms. The third category is what the insurer is presumed to know. Now we try to think of some examples uh, to, to sort of give you a feel for this category. And what we came up with was insurers of construction professionals might be presumed to know from knowledge acquired from previous claims, say, that building sites above former open cast mines are considered high risk sites. And this would come essentially from what would be deemed to be ordinary sort of knowledge acquired in the ordinary course of business. Now I'm going to come on to deal uh, and discuss remedies for breach of duty of disclosure. One of the biggest changes in the Insurance Act relates to remedies for breach of the duty of disclosure. The Insurance Act aims to address the imbalance between the insurer and the insured. At present, the insurer is entitled to avoid a policy for misrepresentation or breach of the insured's duty of disclosure, as highlighted in my earlier example. Under the Insurance Act, the insurer will still continue to have a remedy against the insured for breach of its obligation of fair presentation. However, an insurer is now required to demonstrate that, but for the breach, it would not have entered into the contract of insurance at all, or it would have entered into the contract of insurance on different terms. Remedies are dealt with under Section 8 of the Act. Before the insurer can consider the remedy, it has to consider whether there has been a qualifying breach. A qualifying breach is defined in the Insurance Act as a breach that is either deliberate or reckless, or neither deliberate nor reckless. 
whether a qualifying breach is deliberate or reckless will dictate the remedies that are available to insurers as will be seen on the next slide. In order for a qualifying breach to be deemed to be deliberate or reckless, then the insurer would have to have a known, sorry, the insured would either have to have known that they were in breach of their obligation to make a presentation or did not care whether or not they were in breach of that obligation. The onus is on the insurer to show that a qualifying breach was deliberate or reckless. This makes sense because if the, if the breach is deliberate or reckless, the insurer retains the right to avoid the policy and need not return any premium paid where it would not have entered into the contract of insurance at all or would only have done so on different terms. If the qualifying breach was not deliberate or reckless, the remedies are proportionate to the impact of the breach on the underwriting decision. <coughs> this slide takes us through the various examples of remedies for breach of duty of disclosure. Now you can see in the first box that if the breach is deemed to be deliberate or reckless, then the insurer may avoid the policy altogether and there is no requirement to repay the premium. If the answer to the question has the breach been deliberate or reckless is no, then the next box demonstrates how an insurer needs to approach this issue. The question that then becomes relevant is would the insurer have accepted the risk but charged a higher premium? If the answer to this question is yes, then any claim can be reduced proportionately. For example, if the insurer can show that had it known about the non-disclosed risk, it would have charged a premium of 400,000 instead of 300,000 pounds, claims paid by the insurer could be reduced proportionately by 25%. If the answer to the question, would the insurer have accepted the risk but charged a higher premium is no, then the next question to consider when you move into the next box, box three, is would the insurer have entered into the contract on different terms? Now if the answer to this question is yes, then the insurer may treat the contract as if it contained those terms from the outset. If the answer to this final question is no, then you need to consider a final question which is, would the insurer have entered into the contract at all? If the answer to this question is no, then the contract may be avoided but the premium has to be returned to the insured. I will now hand back to Nathan to discuss warranties, remedies for fraudulent claims and contracting out. What is a warranty? A warranty is a promise made by the policyholder or insured to the insurer which if broken may have harsh consequences including the avoidance of the policy by the insurer. Under the current law warranties must be complied with whether or not they are material or connected to the risk being insured. A warranty may be a term by which an insured undertakes to do or not do something, undertakes that some condition shall be fulfilled or confirms or denies the existence of a particular state of facts. There is no particular form of wording required and warranties may be created in one of three ways. Firstly, a warranty may be created by an express written term within the insurance contract itself. Secondly, an implied, a warranty may be an implied term of the insurance contract by construction of the term. For example, in a car insurance policy, it may be an implied warranty that the car to be insured is roadworthy at all times. Thirdly, a warranty may be created through a basis of contract clause, which converts representations made pre-contract into warranties. Basis of contract clauses under the current law are declarations made pre-contract or on the proposal form that contain representations made by an insured that are warranted to be true and accurate. Again, there is no particular form of wording required, but these may take the form of statements such as form the basis of the contract or by particular reference in the policy itself to the proposal form or other statements being incorporated into the policy itself. 
So what's their effect? Essentially, basis of contract clauses convert all pre-contract representations made by the insured into warranties during the course of the insurance policy. Under the current law, the breach of a warranty by an insured in an insurance contract automatically discharges the insurer from liability completely from that point onwards, even if the breach is remedied or unconnected to the risk being insured. This means that an insurer may avoid liability even if the breached warranty term was entirely unrelated to the type of loss occurred. Under the current law, an insurer may ultimately take the draconian measure of avoiding the policy for a breach of warranty. The easiest way to understand this is by example, again using Ian's earlier example of a warehouse. Under the current law, if a property insurance policy for a warehouse contains a warranty that the warehouse will be fitted with a working burger alarm, if that warranty is breached and the burger alarm is not working or fitted when the property is damaged by fire, the insurer may be able to avoid the policy on the basis that the breach of warranty regarding the burglar alarm was breached. This is even though the burglar alarm would not have prevented the fire from taking place. The Insurance Act 2015 substantially reforms the law of insurance warranties with the aim again of redressing um, an area of law which has been manifestly biased towards insurers. Firstly, the Act abolishes the concept of basis of contract clauses. They will no longer be valid. Secondly, parties to insurance contracts cannot contract out or opt out of this part of the Act. We'll discuss this more in detail later. Thirdly, Section 10.1 of the Act abolishes any rule of law that a breach of warranty results in the full discharge of an insurer's liability. Instead, warranties become suspensive. What this means is that a breach of warranty suspends cover until the breach is remedied. If the breach is remedied before the loss occurred, then it has no impact on the insurance policy. For example, on the diagram on screen, and using our example of a warehouse with a property insurance policy, the policy of insurance is suspended from the date of the breach of the warranty until the warranty is remedied. The policy is then then continues in force until the end of the policy period, which is number four on the diagram. Finally, the Act has brought about the need for a causal link between the breach of warranty and the loss which occurs under the policy. That is, the breach of warranty must now be connected to the loss, whether by example defining a loss of a particular kind, a loss at a particular location, or loss at a particular time. An insurer will not be able to rely upon non-compliance of a warranty if the insured is able to show that non-compliance would not have increased the risk of the loss which has occurred. Therefore, there is said to be a causal requirement between the breach and the loss. Returning to our early example, if a property insurance policy for a warehouse contains a warranty as to the maintenance of a working burglar alarm, if that warranty is breached and the burglar alarm is not working when the property is damaged by fire, the insured would almost certainly be able to demonstrate that a working burglar alarm would not have present, prevented the fire under the new Act. It should, however, be noted that Clause 11 of the new Act contains a carve-out in respect of terms which are said to define the risk as a whole. The example given in the explanatory notes is a term in an, an insurance policy which requires a property or vehicle not to be used commercially and is particularly vague. What defines a risk as a whole is therefore not currently very clear and, is, 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 and it is easy to see that this could be an area where the disputes may occur in the future. Another area of the Act which has been amended or clarified is remedies for fraudulent claims. The Act does not seek to define fraud, but instead sets out what an insurer may do in the event that an insured commits fraud with regards to a claim. The Act basically clarifies and codifies existing law. Whilst not necessarily particularly focused on professional indemnity insurance claims, this amendment is worth covering briefly. When an insured commits a fraud against an insurer, the insurer is not liable to pay the claim to which the fraud relates and, 
if the insurer has already paid, it can recover the monies when paid out, paid out when it subsequently discovers the fraud. In addition, insurers have another option which is to give notice that the contract is terminated from the date of the fraudulent act with no obligation to return the premium. This enables an insurer to refuse all liability in respect of a relevant event after the fraudulent act. A relevant event is specified as referring to whatever gives rise to the insurer's liability under the policy. This is usually the loss or damage or, under a professional indemnity insurance policy, the notification of a particular claim. Now, in respect of group insurance policies, Section 13 covers fraudulent claims by members of a group insurance policy. Where an individual member or subsidiary commits a fraud, but the other members of the group policy have not, the fraudulent claimant and the insurer are treated as though they have entered into a separate contract of insurance between them. This means that the innocent members of the insurance policy are not unfairly prejudiced and their insurance remains in place. Moving on to contracting out. While the Act is intended to be the default regime for commercial insurance contracts, it is recognised that some provisions may not be suitable for all markets and all commercial parties. The Act therefore allows the parties to commercial insurance contracts to contract or opt out of the default regime. The only exception to this is in respect of the abolition of basis of contract clauses which parties cannot opt out of. It may well be that many insureds have well-developed policies which suit their needs and currently provide terms that are equal to or more advantageous than the new Act already provides or, what, or the, than the new Act will provide. If, however, an insurer wishes to include or exclude a contractual term which puts the insured in a worse position than the Act would otherwise provide, then this must meet the transparency requirements set out in the new Act. These are that an insurer must take sufficient steps to draw the disadvantageous term to the insurer's attention before the contract is entered into or a variation of an insurance contract agreed and the disadvantageous term must be clear and unambiguous as to its effect. In determining whether the transparency requirements have been met, the characteristics of an insured and the circumstances of the insurance transaction should be taken into account. What this means in practice is that an insurer will have to do less to bring the provision to the attention of a large sophisticated insured which is advised by experienced lawyers, brokers or has its own insurance department than it would for a sole trader insured. Also it will be sufficient to communicate just with the broker where he is acting as an agent of the insured rather than directly with the insured. I'll now hand over to Ian again who will discuss changes in respect of the Third Parties Rights Against Insurers Act 2010. The 2010 Act has now been updated to reflect changes in insolvency law. Accordingly, the long-awaited 2010 Act will finally come into force on the 1st of August this year, so a few days before the Insurance Act comes into force on the 12th of August. The 2010 Act is intended to make it easier for third-party claimants to bring direct actions against insurers where an insured has become insolvent. The key changes coming in are as follows. Firstly, there will no longer be any need for the third party to first establish the insured's liability to it. The 2010 Act will allow a third party to litigate the substantive cause of action alongside an action for an order that the insurer pays any damages awarded. Secondly, the definition of an insolvent company has now been updated. Thirdly, 
The 2010 Act allows a third party who believes he has a right of action under the 2010 Act to obtain information about the rights transferred both before and after the issue of proceedings. If it can be established that there is a contract of insurance that covers or might reasonably be expected to cover the supposed liability, then information can now be obtained on the following. Firstly, the identity of the insurer. Secondly, the terms of the insurance, so for example, the policy schedule and the policy wording. Thirdly, whether there are or have been proceedings issued. And finally, whether there is an aggregate limit of indemnity, and if so, how much. A person, i.e. an insurer who receives a notice requesting such information, is now obliged under the new legislation within 28 days, beginning with the date of the receipt of the notice, to provide as much of the information specified as they can. And if they cannot provide this information, they need to state why and they need to provide details of any other person who might be able to supply this information to the third party. Failure to comply with a notice requesting information permits the third party to apply to the court for an order compelling compliance. In addition, the third party may also request information from any person that he or she reasonably believes could provide the information. This might include brokers, former employees and anyone else authorised to hold policy information. The thinking behind this provision is that it should enable the third party to make a more informed decision on whether or not to commence or to continue the litigation against the insurer. The 2010 Act retains the general approach of the 1930 Act that the rights transferred to the third party will still be subject to the defences which the insurer could have used against the insured. So for example, if the insurer had a good um, argument to avoid the policy or to decline cover in respect of a breach of warranty or breach of condition precedent, they would still be able to use those defences under the 2010 Act should a third party seek to make a claim against them. However, the 2010 Act introduces the following three exceptions which are designed to defeat what was known as technical defences. Firstly, anything done by the third party which, if done by the insured, would have amounted to or contributed to fulfilment of the condition is to be treated as if done by the insured. So for example, the third party will be able to give notification of a claim where a policy provides that the notification must be made by the insured itself. A second exception is that insurers can now no longer rely on a defence of breach of duty to provide information where the insured is a an individual who has died or b a body corporate that has been dissolved. And finally, insurers can no longer rely on pay first clauses. The main impacts of the 2010 Act are largely going to be felt by insurers rather than insureds. I have given consideration to the possible likely effects on insurers, which I would be more than happy to share with you after this webinar if anyone is of interest, rather than to discuss them now. On that note, I will hand over to Craig, who will discuss some practical insurance considerations in light of the new legislation. Thank you for that, Ian. Um, so, by definition, a once in a hundred year change to any legal framework is going to create uncertainty when that change impacts on virtually all UK insurance policyholders, brokers and insurers. That change, and that change involves the fundamental underpinning of that relationship. That uncertainty is going to be magnified many times over. That said, I think the industry has had some time to prepare and I think that most of the insurance community have been able to get to grips with their new obligations and implement new measures to ensure a smooth transition to the new regime.
We have heard from Nathan and Ian about the detail of uh, the changes that the Act will bring. And for this closing part of the webinar, it's my job to turn the overhaul of 100 years of insurance law in some practical notes for you all as buyers of insurance, and in particular, professional indemnity insurance. It's worth stating at the outset that the changes the Act will bring affects both you as policyholders, me as your insurance broker, other insurance brokers are available, and your insurer as the risk transfer party. All of us are going to be affected by the Act, and we have all been feeling our way through the issues over the last year or so. Time will tell if and to what extent industry has delivered. Before going on to outline some of the steps that you can take to help bring yourselves in line with the new order, it is worth making a few general points. Whilst the Act will change many things about how much information is required from you, how that information should be presented and disclosed, and how your insurers will handle your claim should one arise, it is likely that what the majority of you do now to buy your insurance might not change all that much. Proposal forms will still be sent out, insurers and brokers will still ask you questions about them, though perhaps more so going forward, supplementary information will still be required, meetings will still be held, site visits will still be undertaken, we'll continue to argue about Brexit. For many, the status quo, with perhaps some modification around the edges, may well still be sufficient. This is not to say that everyone will, or indeed should, do nothing. There are some firms for whom the Act should act as a welcome catalyst for change in the way, <coughs> the, sorry, the way they gather, record, and present their renewal submission. I would also say that the Act, although bringing about welcome change, is not of itself going to solve the problems of ensuring satisfactory insurance outcomes. Whilst the Act is pro-policyholder, it does not follow that this makes your burden of disclosure any less. What it does do is offer you the opportunity to create a more sound insurance response, but only for those firms who are prepared to spend the time and effort in engaging with their brokers and insurers. Your relationship with your broker and your insurer will be just as important after the summer holidays as it is, it is today. Behind this time and effort, you'll still find some very old and well-tested principles apply, mainly a quality insurance submission, good record keeping, and preparing in good time. None of this is new. It is hard to argue that the intentions of the Act are not admirable, nor the underlying purpose, which is to encourage professionalism amongst insurance buyers and intermediaries, not well-intentioned. But there may be some uncertainty in the months and years ahead, and perhaps even unintended consequences. So the Act, whilst undoubtedly providing benefits for insureds over the medium and long term, is not going to replace ensuring the basics are right either. You'll still need to ensure that your policy wording is as robust as it is now. You'll continue to need to make disclosure, probably just as much as you do now, and in my view, always erring on the side of caution. So if in doubt about something, tell your insurer. As ever in Construction PI, it's important you continue to work with insurers and brokers who understand your business. The final thing to say in this introductory session is that certain brokers and certain insurers will have created perhaps more benign environments on matters relating to disclosure, and it actually may be the Insurance Act bring no, brings no major changes to your world other than modest changes to proposal forms and policy wordings. Again, always best to check with your broker if you enjoy such a scheme. So what are the areas worth considering in order to help with satisfying your obligations under the Act? I think the first thing which is often overlooked is timing. I think if you haven't already started to think about what you're going to do at the next renewal, you start thinking about that now. Whilst it's likely that smaller businesses will find their duties under the Act easier to discharge, this does not hold true for every business, and even one-man bands might need to undertake a reasonably complicated exercise to discharge their duties under the Act, particularly if they work in an unusual area. So I'm very much looking forward to the renewal of a firm of engineers who designed the M&E behind emergency escape hatches for nuclear submarine rescue vehicles. However, Whatever your profession, it's wise to think about starting your renewal process a little earlier than usual, and that's going to be to ensure you have time to, one, 
collect the information that you're required to disclose to insurers from the potentially wider cast of individuals required. So it's going to be good practice to ensure these requests are sent out to colleagues and that the responses are kept and readily saved. You're also going to need extra time, quite probably, to collate this information into a suitable form. So the days of simply dumping information on your insurer are probably gone, as it's just not going to help you anymore. And finally, you will need time, perhaps at the end of the process, to sign off whatever extra information your insurer asks for as they start to uh, ask more questions of you. Uh, and that last point is, I think, one change that will bring about that insurers will start to more robustly challenge and make inquiries on elements of your renewal presentation. I think they'll definitely take a more proactive approach in trying to get information from you, additional information from you, or seek clarification on, on matters you've put down in your proposal form. So don't be surprised if, following the introduction of the Act, you start to get some questions from the insurers on information you've submitted. I think, needless to say, having to do all this at the 11th hour is not the best of times, particularly if you are trying to get the best deal on price and coverage at the same time. The next uh, major part of our world is going to be the duty of fair presentation and what this means. And although Ian and Nathan have already talked about this in the context of the detail, I think I'm going to make some fairly garish simplifications of, of what this is for, for my practical purposes. So let's characterize it for the purposes of today as being that insureds must disclose actual knowledge of the senior management team, uh, which will include internal and external insurance advisors. In the case of sole traders, this is going to be the individuals themselves and again, their insurance advisors. And the second limb is going to be information received by a reasonable search. This last point, I think a lot of us have been said about this duty, and you can certainly find a great deal of information online. But in practical terms, what does the entire duty mean and what might compliance look like? In relation to actual knowledge, this ought to be relatively straightforward, though there could be complications, particularly in the case of corporate buyers. For corporate insureds, knowledge will include information known to senior management, which is described by the Act as those individuals who play a significant role in the making of decisions about how the insured's activities are to be managed and organised. Potentially, for even organisations of relatively modest size, this could mean that compliance with the Act would likely, making, would likely mean making inquiries of a wide number of people when completing your return to insurers. However, for most, I suspect, this will not be new territory. We'd expect that as part of current disclosure preparations, that the board and senior management, including your in-house risk or insurance manager, would be actively involved in putting together renewal information. However, the Act certainly highlights the need for this level of scrutiny, and if you do not already do so, it is certainly important to ensure that senior management is demonstrably involved in putting it together. Although the key information that insurers will need will vary widely from policyholder to policyholder, some following key points should certainly be investigated. So things like claims or circumstances which might give rise to claims should definitely be discussed and raised with a broker, as I imagine they are now. Any new areas of work, for example, an M&E practice starting to undertake minor structural work, will definitely be relevant and should be disclosed to your broker or insurer. Any work undertaken outside the UK that's not been previously disclosed should be something you're raising as a matter of course. Even things like work which is a significantly higher overall contract value than previously undertaken could be relevant for your insurers. Things like any new joint ventures you're undertaking, again, should be disclosed. I think the important question to ask yourselves is what does your broker think they are? What are the key bits of your business and what are the key things that your insurer wants to know? Not all insurers are created equal, and what might be vital for one might be something and nothing for another. In addition to refreshing the need for senior management to engage with the process, I think it's also going to be advantageous to consider a few simple points. So an internal review to identify the individuals and positions which make up senior management within your firm would be a good idea. These might include members of the board, risk and insurance managers, and people on senior management committees. Ensure that your renewal process clearly documents the involvement of these individuals. 
and use the act as an opportunity, an opportunity to raise awareness on the burdens it places, both with staff members and the board themselves. I think the more people understand why you're asking for the renewal information of your colleagues and the consequences of failing to provide it, the more likely they are to be helpful. And finally, consider undertaking an external review with your broker. So on what they consider is relevant and proportionate for you in your particular circumstances. Some organizations, even of modest size, are starting to try to agree with their broker and insurer and narrow a list of positions which fall within senior management with a view to avoiding potential disputes as to whose knowledge is relevant for disclosure purposes. It may be possible this way to restrict those with actual knowledge which must be disclosed. So whilst there are some areas around knowledge to consider, for most, disclosing what is known should, be, should not actually be too difficult. The Act does, however, create a new idea of a requirement to disclose information which, quoting from the Act, should have been revealed by a reasonable search of information available to the insured. The Act goes on to say that this could include not only information held within the organisation, but by people covered by the insurance which could include employees and subcontractors. Brokers and agents will definitely be caught by it too. The requirement to undertake a reasonable search should, therefore, broaden insured horizons as to which individuals and parties need to be considered when collating the information required to complete an insurance return. This duty could involve a potentially onerous obligation, given that what is reasonable in this context is open to interpretation and, of course, as yet untested by the courts. Where insureds might get into difficulty in the future with an alleged failure to conduct a reasonable search, say, where a material fact is known somewhere in the business but has not been identified by the search, the key will be to try to show that the search was carried out in a robust way with a well-documented audit trail. I think policyholders should, therefore, firstly, be engaging their brokers now and agreeing what might constitute a reasonable search in their circumstances. This might mean thinking about simple things like who should be consulted, how you'll carry out the search, so is it going to be email exchanges, telephone conversations, site visits or formal questionnaires. Again, you'll have to pick something that's proportionate for your firm's needs. And finally, who will be responsible for disclosing information that the broker holds? So historical information in relation to activities, claims, surveys. Is it going to be you as the insured or will your broker do this for you? More broadly, you'll need to ensure that steps are taken to complete the search and that the process is properly documented to provide a suitable audit trail. So consider, if you don't already do things like this, a regular litigation trawl, document its issue, and any responses, and obviously notify your insurers and brokers of any problems which this, this might bring up. Should the need arise, being able to evidence a robust methodology is going to be crucial in defending your position under the Act. Finally, it's obvious that you'll need to agree a process as to how the material information relevant to your firm is going to be collected and disclosed to your insurers. I think the overall importance of being able to evidence that you've undertaken a satisfactory reasonable search is so important, this is something that you should definitely be discussing with your broker or insurer as to what's required and what processes should be adopted and how that should be recorded. Clearly, all this work needs to be proportionate to the size and complexity of the organisation involved. So again, I can't stress enough, speak to your broker. The final two areas we're going to consider today are also new developments and will need some consideration and planning. The first is the requirements under the Act that disclosure uh, must be undertaken in a manner which would be reasonably clear and accessible to a prudent insurer. This imposes additional obligations on insureds to present information in an ordered and reasonably user-friendly manner. Whilst most insureds will do so, by virtue of the proposal forms they complete, for the larger and more specialised risks, or where you're providing information beyond that in the proposal, insureds should consider how the reasonably accessible requirement impacts their existing data collection processes. So are the systems so unwieldy that you're effectively just dumping Excel files on your broker? They may well need to be changed. 
What changes, therefore, may need to be required to ensure that disclosure is undertaken in an accessible manner, having regard to the amount of information required? And again, you should be seeking guidance from the insurer as to what information they are particularly concerned about and what they feel should be highlighted. The final new aspect of the Act we'll need to consider relates to matters which the Act states need not be disclosed. These are matters which the Act specifies are not required to be disclosed to the insurer in the absence of inquiry, namely circumstances which diminish the risk or which the insurer knows, ought to know or is presumed to know. In practice, I don't feel that policyholders should rely on this to limit their disclosure unless they have sought specific confirmation from insurers as to the information they already hold about the business and therefore which does not require further disclosure. When changing insurer, insurers should discuss with the brokers what information from previous renewals should be disclosed. So before closing, a few final thoughts which might be worth considering. It might be an idea to request from your broker a copy of their submission so that you can ensure that nothing is missing in what they've presented to insurers on your behalf or has become diluted. I think as ever, this again highlights the need to consider very carefully the implications of changing your broker or insurer. Any change will present a clear break in historical knowledge which will need to be addressed. If you undertake a complex submission, you might want to take this opportunity to change it to make sure that it is more easily navigable and incorporate adequate signposting to ensure that important risk features are highlighted. Again, use your broker's experience to help with this. I think the duties under the Act, um, the old duties and the new duties, will all present opportunities uh, for you to refresh and refocus your insurance buying processes. And I definitely encourage anyone to think about what the, whether they're doing now is sufficient. I think, as I've probably said several times, it's vital uh, in ensuring compliance that you engage with your broker through this process. He'll be able to point you in the right direction if needed uh, and should be able to provide additional resources as well. And that ends it from the insurance bit today. So I'll now hand over back to Nathan, who will provide some closing comments. Well, thank you very much, Craig. Um, just to conclude then, the Act has been welcomed by many as it aims to bring commercial insurance law up to date and is deemed to address the current perceived imbalance in the law in favour of insurers. We hope that some of the points discussed today will have been of interest. As Craig said, the next few months and indeed years will no doubt bring with them clarification on the impacts of the new Act and we hope to keep you informed of those developments in the future. I'd like to thank Craig for his time today and you for listening. If you're interested in receiving an invitation to our next webinar, which is on the topic of limitation of liability, please don't hesitate to contest us on webinar at bill-law.com. Once again, thank you for listening.